You're listening to Searching for More, a podcast of the Diocese of Arlington. On this episode, Father John O'Connor, pastor of St. Francis of Assisi Parish in Triangle, Virginia, talks about what it means to be Franciscan and his experience working with some of New York's real estate elite to build a 63-story skyscraper in Manhattan. We'd go into the negotiating room and our team and their team would end up yelling at each other at one point. I'd come out of the room like this and they'd come out and say, that was a good meeting. And I go like, boy, I'm living in a different world. They're just used to the war zone, I guess. Huh? They, they really are. Hear Father O'Connor talk about perseverance and hope through high stakes ups and downs. This episode's host is Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer for the Catholic Diocese of Arlington. Father, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Okay, you're welcome. So I want to, uh, before we dig, you've got some really interesting stories in your background that I want to dig into, but um, I think to understand you best, we have to start with you know Franciscan spirituality. And I was actually working for the church by, before I ever had heard of different spiritualities. I just thought people have individual like spiritual lives, but I realized that there's a Dominican one, right? There's a, Je- there's a Jesuit, there's a um, you know, Franciscan, obviously. So there's all these different spiritualities. What makes Franciscan spirituality special and also what drew you to it? Okay. Um, I've written, actually written down just a few things here. A, a few years ago, the uh, diocese asked me to do a presentation to the principals of the diocese on Franciscan spirituality. Okay. So I'm going to share some of what I said to them at that time. There are several different aspects of Francis, and these were the aspects of Franciscan spirituality that drew me to be a Franciscan. Uh, I, I had contemplating priesthood for a long, long period of my life, way mm-hmm. back to even when I was in elementary school and that. And it was because of meeting a friar that I finally chose to know more about the Franciscans and to become a Franciscan. But the qualities of Francis that most drew me to him and the characteristics of Franciscan spirituality are these. First of all, he he lived a spirit of gentleness in uh, his relationships with others. Uh, And uh, everything you know about Francis was that this was the, the Pavarello. In fact, we friars, OFM in our name means Order of Friars Minor or Lesser Brothers. And Francis always wanted us to approach life in a gentle way Mm. as lesser brothers, not to be arrogant, not to be in a sense clerical in our ministry, not to hold ourselves above other people or see ourselves as an elite class, but really to be one of them. Uh, The second is he saw all his brothers and sisters. uh, Interesting, two of the encyclicals that Pope Francis most recently uh, presented are are based on Franciscan spirituality. Uh, Laudato Si in terms of creation and uh, Fratelli Tutti and, and he saw, and he reached out to everyone as brothers and sisters. The famous story of Francis and the Sultan, mm. how he reached out to the Muslims at the time of the Crusades and that, and no one else was doing that. Uh, you know, others were fighting, and Francis was trying to de- develop a dialogue yeah. uh, with, the, with the Sultan at that time. Uh, his strong ecological stance. Um, he didn't see nature as lifeless objects. The Cantilever Brother Sun is a great example of that. Mm. He talked about the sun and the animals and the earth and plants, all of this as his brothers and sisters. And we Franciscans, uh, more than ever now, uh, are committed to working with those that, that are doing their best to respond to this great challenge of climate change. And, and we're getting great leadership from Pope Francis on that, as well as our own Minister General in Rome yeah. and our General uh, Administration. Um, he, um, he, pl- he developed an attitude of joy, optimism, and enthusiasm. Uh, I always say to people, they say, what's Franciscans about? It's perhaps best capsulized in Francis when he would go and meet people and speak to them. He would say to them, good morning, good people. And that is our approach as Franciscans. We see people as basically good. Obviously, uh, we sin at times, all right. of us. But, um, but we see them as basically good, and we work with people to really help them to develop the goodness that's in them and the holiness that's in them. Mm. And so our approach is always to be as positive and as joyful and as enthusiasm as possible with the people we minister to. We often have people say to us, you know what I love about the Franciscans is you're upbeat, you're optimistic, you see goodness in us, and uh, you celebrate us, uh, which I think is, is very, very important. And, and also, uh, when our ministry is about creating family so that we, when we interact with people that we're ministering to and with, bring them in so we're all one part of one family. Some years ago at a funeral at St. Bonaventure University, uh, one of the alums came back who was an alum when I was there in the, teaching in the 70s and 80s, and she said to a younger student, she said, you know, you're going to really come to like your experience here 
because what's different here is that those of us who are students here, we watched the friars and their fraternity and their family and how they shared life together. And what was nice is they invited us into that life. Mm. Uh, so it wasn't like them versus us. It was we're in this together at all in terms of discipleship. Uh, so I, I think that's one of the great characteristics. And finally, uh, Francis was very much about walking in the footsteps of Jesus. When you look at him with the stigmata and all, uh, and I just would share this, this passage from uh, Philippians, which I think really best expresses what Francis saw in Jesus and uh, lived in his own life. And it's the one where it says, Make your own mind the mind of Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, becoming as human beings are, and being in every way like a human being. He was humble yet, even to accepting death down a cross. It's that kind of humility that Francis preached and encourage all of his followers to be about. Is there a way in which uh, Franciscan spirituality is lived out in, in the priesthood that's, um, you know, like we have uh, the order of preachers, right? right? So in the name there, you kind of know what, what they do. But, you know, there, there are orders that, that find themselves working in hospital ministries more often than not, schools or whatever. Is there a kind of a core function in which the Franciscan spirituality is lived out amongst priests? The, the, the core function would be uh, the, the vow of poverty. Okay. Uh, and, and Francis stressed poverty, not that poverty for the sake of poverty is a value. It certainly is not, right. and he knew that. But Francis stressed poverty because he knew that if you had less in life, you would turn to those around you and be more dependent on them. And that would create, as, as again, Pope Francis recently said in his encyclical, this understanding and need for reaching out to others as brothers and sisters. The interesting thing about Franciscans is we don't have like this one special thing that we do, like the order of preachers. We preach. We do education. Um, we work with the inner city with the poorest of the poor, and we do that in countries throughout the world. We, we work at leprosariums in some of the countries. Um, I did some fundraising for the order in which we were uh, training our friars in, in Africa to be able to learn agricultural skills to help the people to make the most out of what they had in those areas and that. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting in education, everybody says, well, the Jesuits do education. Most people don't realize that the order of sisters and brothers, Franciscans, we have the second most uh, institutions of higher education in the United States, sponsored by a religious order. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, and most people say, oh, no, the Jesuits do that. We do it, too. Yeah. And if you look at the history of the Franciscan order, some of the greatest scholars in Western civilization, St. Bonaventure, Duns Scotus, uh, all of it, a number of the people like that, they were, um, they were Franciscans, and they taught at the University of Paris and Oxford and these great places. That's interesting. Yeah. That's so, interesting. So I guess to answer that, it, it's basically we, we take our charism and we bring into doing a number of different kinds of things. So you're the pastor at uh, St. Francis of Assisi in, in Triangle, which is kind of in the, the front door or the back door, however you want to put it, of, of Quantico, Virginia. So it's a very unique area. But you've served in higher education as well. Would you share a little bit about what you did in, in uh, the university level? Yes, I was, uh, in 1973, I uh, was ordained and went to St. Bonaventure University, where I became co-director of campus ministry and then director of campus ministry. At that time, the university developed the university parish. Uh, Diocese of Buffalo set up these campus parishes. I became the first pastor and was pastor for a number of years. And then um, I decided, you know, I think I'm going to teach. And uh, so I got permission to teach, and I wrote a curriculum for a course on Catholic Christian sacraments. Hmm. Interesting enough, at that point, they had not had a course on sacraments. They had other courses in the theology right. department, but not on sacraments. <laughs> those are kind of important. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, you know, <laughs> you've got fond of mostly Catholic the students. It would be nice if they knew something about the sacraments. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, developed the course, wrote the curriculum. It was approved. Of course, it had to be approved not just by the university, but the state of New York, if you're going to teach a course even in private schools. Really? Yeah, yeah. So That's had, unique. Yeah, yeah, it had to be submitted to the State Education Board, and they approved the curriculum. And so I taught, I only taught because I was director of campus ministry and pastor of the parish, one course a semester, but I had 60 students. My courses would close out with full enrollment. Wow. And I had mostly juniors and seniors. And, and I like teaching, and apparently they like me because each year <laughs> the senior class chooses its most favorite professor over four years of higher education at St. Bonaventure. Yeah. In the last three years, I was chosen twice, and the year I was leaving, they asked me to do the baccalaureate homily. That's so, wonderful. Yeah, so it was. But I'd feel good. You obviously uh, uh, created something there, and you, you received an honorary degree as well. I right? did a, a doctorate uh, 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 in, in humanities, um, 
And that was in recognition of my leadership in the order, uh, as well as uh, I, I, I had served on the board for almost 28 years at St. Yeah. Bonaventure, also the board of Siena College and several other uh, nonprofits. And so it was re recognition of my leadership uh, on those two levels. While I was provincial, I was also elected president of the English-speaking conference of the Order of Friars Minor. Okay. And in doing that, I represent over 2,000 Franciscans in the countries in the world where English is the primary language. Wow. Uh, I then, during that period, also ended up uh, being asked to be the uh, acting definitive general of the Order of Friars Minor. Uh, the definitive general uh, is one of um, several people, seven or eight people, that are on a board that, with the minister general and the vicar general, are the administration of the order throughout the world, 14,000 plus Franciscans wow. in, in 120 countries. And the person who was the definitive general from the English speaking area developed cancer, had come back to the States. Mm. So they asked me to uh, do that for nine months, 10 months. I didn't have to go to Rome because I was also provincial. So I, oh, I was not going to give me a to, break. They gave me a break. So, <laughs> I, but with modern communication, I was in touch with the Minister General of the Order. Wow. Who at that time was uh, Jose, Most Reverend Jose Caballo, a uh, Spaniard. So I didn't, I didn't realize. It. So there is kind of a, a global governing body uh, for the Franciscan orders. Is that right? Is that what you're referring to, basically? There is. <clears throat> Our headquarters it sits right above the Vatican. In fact, it overlooks the Vatican in Rome. And, and yes, the, the, we have a Minister General, we have a Vicar General. And then we have, again, I think it's six or seven right now, definitive generals, and they are responsible for the entire order. Interesting. Uh, in 120 countries. That's interesting. Okay. So, you know, for those listening, you know, a diocese has a structure where, you know, the, the priests are accountable to the bishop, but the bishop has a vicar general, which you just meant. I didn't realize that was a title also for, within religious orders as well, yeah. um, who is kind of the right hand of the bishop and overseeing a lot of the uh, administrative <clears throat> functions also often is a liaison with the priests. And, you know, it's a, it's a very high, important role. For, but, you know, um, Franciscans don't report to any bishop. They report to their provincial, but they usually, if they're serving in a diocese, have a close relationship with that bishop and are partnering in providing for the, the spiritual needs of the faithful wherever they're they yeah, assigned Yes, a, a, um, a, a province of Franciscans is a, a geographic area. It's like a region, basically. It's a region. Right? Yeah. And a provincial is, is an ordinary, uh, according to canon law, is equivalent to a bishop. The only exception right. is a couple of exceptions. One is we can't ordain. The other is we have term limits and we're elected by our peers. Now I've talked to a number of bishops. I worked with 23 cardinals, archbishops, and bishops. My province was the East Coast of the United States. I had over 400 priests that I was responsible wow. for that reported to me, which is more than a lot of bishops have. Yeah, certainly. But I used to say to the bishops, well, one of the things is we have term limits, and a number of them said to me, that's not a bad idea, John. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of like that ourselves. Yeah. But, but I had good relationships. We'd meet with quite a few of them every year and that. I have a very good relationship with Bishop Burbridge. Yeah. He and I worked together on some things when he was down in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, at that time, we had two parishes in Raleigh Diocese. We have one now. He has tremendous respect for you. I think. Um, talk about vocations to the Franciscan order. So, you know, the Franciscans obviously have been around for a long time, and, and they, but there, there's been a... Um, the, the priesthood has taken a hit, you know, in certain areas, you know, some, some areas more than others in terms of vocations. How, how are the OFMs doing in terms of vocational recruitment and so on? Here in the United States, uh, we're actually, we have um, seven provinces. Six of the provinces are going to become one in 2023. Mm. Uh, not in s any small part due to the fact that our numbers aren't what they used to be. Right. Um, we have in our um, House of Theology Formation House uh, out in Chicago right now, there's probably 20-something from the different provinces and that. Our province, Holy Name, has always done quite well. We'll bring in five, six, seven or so postulants. So, uh, the program is they go through postulancy first, then novitiate, right. uh, and then they go into post-novitiate, which for many is theology in preparation for the priesthood. But we have done well. Are we doing great? We're not doing great here in the U.S. It's pretty typical of most of the religious orders. Mm -hmm. We have vocations are booming in the Far East and in uh, Africa, uh, in India, places like that. Uh, we have quite a few people that are in formation. That's uh, Vietnam, for example, we have all kinds of people in training. Uh, in the information program there. If we're not careful here in the U.S., we're going to be the mission territory for the Vietnamese. All the places that we went were... <laughs> it's going to be a great irony, right? It's going to be a great yeah, irony. Yeah, uh, yeah. In terms of what our history was. Not what we delight in, but you can't help but uh, notice the irony. So again, I mentioned that you're, you're the pastor at St. Francis of Assisi in Triangle. Talk about the community there, and, and I, I know you, you love, you know, that parish and the yeah. community there. Talk about what it is that you love so much about it. 
Well, it, it's, a, it's a young parish, very, very young. I think at one point somebody did a, a, a study on it and said the average age, including children, was 28.9 years old. Wow. So we have a lot of young families of children. Uh, we have a school. Uh, we have a great principal, Dr. Dr. Barber, and her staff do a great job. Um, we are, some people say, well, we are almost all military. Actually, we're not because the base had Catholic chaplains. Now they have a contract priest who's there. There is some discussion about us perhaps at some point taking responsibility for the base, but we do have people come out from there. And then, of course, we have military that are part of the Army and Air Force and that. But we also have what most parishes have. We have law enforcement. We have government contractors. We have people in hotel industry, kind of a cross-section. So you've got the there. DEA Academy there, the FBI Academy. We have the FBI, you've got a lot of folks DEA, there, yeah. 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 We have quite a bit of law enforcement that are there and that. But uh, when I was first pastor there in the 90s, uh, the parish was probably, and the school, mostly Caucasian. Now we're probably 45% minority, maybe 50%. Certainly our school is. It, we've seen that kind of change, which in many ways reflects the change in demographics in the United States yeah. and in this area. Prince William County is the first county, and I think the only one so far in the state of Virginia, where the, the uh, Caucasians are the minority. Hmm. The minority is the majority in terms of the demographic of Prince William County. Interesting. And we're seeing that. Uh, so it's a great parish, uh, a lot of spirit, uh, just good, good people. Uh, and when the bishop came down, he said to me, um, he was there for my installation, and he said to me afterwards, you know what, people here really like each other. <laughs> and I said, I said they, they do. And, uh, and we have a great outreach program at Francis House, which was recently named one of the 10 uh, top 10 outreach programs in Northern Virginia. Mm. Uh, and I established that in the 1990s. And, and uh, we give out uh, food to over 100 families a week now, plus financial assistance. Uh, when COVID, pre-COVID, we also do ESL programs, uh, Mommy and Me programs for young moms and that. So it's a, it's a wide variety of uh, services for, for the poor and, and uh, those first-generation immigrants, among others. Now, I know you'll, you'll go wherever the order needs you. That's part of being a Franciscan, and you've worked at the highest levels of church governance, and you're also working, obviously, at the most localized you know, level of, of, of church ministry. Is there one that, if, if you got to pick, that you, you, do, you, do you want to be, you know, do you, do you enjoy the kind of the hands-on approach of Parish Life, or do you miss sometimes the, the impact you can have at a, you know, a, a national level as a, as a provincial or whatever? Well, I was enjoying, I, I was, after I was provincial, I was appointed the executive assistant to the head of the Franciscan Order in Rome. Initially, they wanted me to move to Rome. And I said to the Minister General, you know, with all due respect, those neurons to learn Italian fluently, <laughs> they're not working anymore. And I said, the other thing is the money's not in, in, in Italy, it's in the United States. I mean, that's where you, so I'd be on a plane coming back here. So right. he said, okay, fine, where do you want to, and I said, I'd like to go back and live in the Washington area. And I really enjoyed that a lot, uh, and I was getting, I was pretty successful at it, and I had a number of major donors. And then we had a situation in the parish where the pastor had to be relieved of his responsibilities, and the bishop uh, called me and said, "Would you be the administrator, Bishop Laverty?" And I said yes. And then Bishop Burbridge came in and said, "Would you be the uh, the pastor?" And eventually, I had to think about that because I really yeah. liked what I was doing, and that was on the internet. I was part of the international leadership team of the Order of Friars Minor. And right. I'd go to Rome for meetings, and uh, and at one point they wanted me to travel a good part of the world, and then then I end up being the administrator here. So probably never get a chance to do that. But they wanted me to go to many of the countries where we are several countries in Africa, several countries in the Far East, and uh, it's not going to happen at yeah. this point. But, but that, that was, that's, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, earlier on in life, at one point, I was uh, offered the position of Executive Vice President of St. Bonaventure University. Would have loved to have done that. But at that point, uh, I was um, director of our seminary, Holy Name College, and the provincial at the time said, I need you to continue for three more years. So I had to turn that down. But yeah, I, I love Bonnie's and would have loved to have been in that position. Yeah. Well, d despite that, you have a lot of interesting accomplishments, and I want to talk about one of them. So mm -hmm. is there another Franciscan that's ever built a skyscraper <laughs> in New York City? <laughs> not, 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 not in New York City. Uh, in not, general? <laughs> what I'm told is there, there isn't. There's friars who have built different things, but I don't think anybody's ever built a skyscraper before. So t talk about how that project came about. Where were you, now, are you you're born in Brooklyn? I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I was yeah. born in Brooklyn, actually, also. Oh, okay. That's actually overlap. But um, so... Talk about, you know, how that kind of came to be. Were you already a, a friar, and, and then what was the process like? Yes, actually, I was the pastor here back uh, in the uh, early 2000s. I was pastor here until 
2002, 2003, and still lived here. But even in the first year of negotiation, I was still pastor here. So it was several different uh, uh, balls that I was juggling at the time, hats that I had on. And um, I, I was elected to the provincial administration. So in a province, you have the provincial, the vicar provincial, and then you have six councillors, which are an advisory board. It would be like the bishop has his bishop's consultor. Right, board. yeah. The, yeah. And, uh, and so uh, at that time, I was also either co-director or director of financial operations for the province. And in that capacity, I took a look at our property in New York City. And the friary itself needed millions of dollars of renovation. We had five buildings, these loft buildings, they go back to the late 1800s, yeah. early 1900s. Everything needed work. Everything needed work. We had friars living in a building where their, their, their bedroom was about as big as a closet. And when they would come out, they would have to walk all the way down a corridor, go into the next building and down a corridor to go to the bathroom. Oh, wow. And, you know, we got older guys in that. So, right. uh, <laughs> But anyway, so I said to my predecessor, who was provincial at the time, I said, listen, we really need to do something. Either we're going to put a lot of money into fixing these buildings up and we're not going to make any money doing that. We're just going to have to pay out millions. Or I'd like to propose that you let me do a feasibility study about tearing the buildings, five of them, between 31st and 32nd Street, 6th and 7th Avenue, Midtown Manhattan, to the ground and build a skyscraper. Well, <laughs> the first reaction I got, everybody was like, are you kidding? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not kidding. I, I think maybe we could do this. So re reluctantly, quite frankly, they said, all right, what do you want to do? I said, a feasibility study. So I hired a firm, Perkins and Eastman, which is an architectural firm in New York, and they put together 10 experts. We had engineers, architects, lawyers, uh, people, experts in demographics, transportation, everything. They spent um, two months. I gave them two months. I said, I need an answer, and this is the question. Is it possible? Is it feasible? And is now the time to do it? At the end of two months, they came back and said, yes and yes, but we need to caution you. They said, uh, a project this big, hundreds of millions of dollars, you're going to need to go in partnership with a major developer, which I, I presumed all along. And, and they said, you need to know something about major developers. Most of them don't want or need partners because they're mil millionaires or billionaires. In fact, one of my partners in this project was a billionaire. And, and they said the second thing about them is that they, they, um, they, they don't want naive partners. Well, we're naive partners. I don't have a, didn't have a single course in business administration in college. Uh, so I had no background in this at all. And third is, you, you love this one, and they don't like ethical partners. <laughs> yeah. They don't like ethical partners. So I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. During the process of the, of the meetings, I noticed they kept referring to this, this one lawyer. I'm not going to mention his name publicly. Uh, but... Um, they say, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And so after the meeting was over, I said, thank you. And I turned to him while we were walking out. I said, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, obviously, you must be top notch. And he was. He's one of the best in the United States, I found out later. Would you work for me if we do this? He said, I will. And, and so it went on from there. And uh, we, we, <laughs> we, he and I became like brothers. We met almost every day for four years, wow. uh, Monday through Friday, uh, either by phone, a lot by phone, or in his office here in Washington or in New York City. And, and negotiations were really tough, tough. It, it, it is, we'd go into the negotiating room and our team and their team would end up yelling at each other at one point. I'd come out of the room like this and they'd come out and say, that was a good meeting. And I'd go like, boy, I'm living in a different world. They're just used to the war zone, I guess, huh? They, they really are. One, one of the major developers in the last couple of years or so was talking about real estate development in New York City. And he said, and this is his quote, he said, real estate development in New York City is about bluffs, it's about deception, and it's about threats. Oh, bluffs, deception, and threats. It explains why the mafia had such a tight hold on this. <laughs> it might be like remnants of that. Their, their work style apparently right, is carried right. over. And I can tell you a couple of, I can give you a lot of examples, but how <laughs> I dealt with this over the I mean, some nights I wouldn't sleep because I was really out there alone. In fact, at one point, the friars in New York City referred to the project as O'Connor's Folly. <laughs> An interesting which the article doesn't say, while I was negotiating this, I was also negotiating building a skyscraper in Boston. Our partner for that was Tishman Spire, who's one of the major, they own Rockefeller Center. Uh, that didn't happen because if you remember back in the early 2006 and 2007, a recession hit. When wow. Obama came in, we yeah. had to bail out the auto industries and that. Right. But we kept going, and, and my advisors had warned me there were dark financial clouds coming in the early 2000s, so we moved as quick as we could to get in the ground, uh, as quick as we could. But a couple of experiences. One is that after negotiating for two years, we're at a table, and my partners, one turns to the other and says, okay, it's a go. 
and I grabbed and I said, am I hearing you right that for two years now you weren't sure you were going to do this? And we, we, I mean, just legal fees for projects like that is in the oh, millions of dollars. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, they kind of hemmed and hawed and said, well, we had to look at the options and all of that. But the other was, and this is, this is really a case of um, um, how tough it can be, the night before we close on the project, and this is four years of negotiation. I get so closing means what, like signing a construction contract? Getting or? ready to sign all the documents that were going ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, and we, we already started construction. We had to because we heard there was a recession type coming. Okay. So you, you, you do closings at different points on three uh, hundreds of million dollar projects. And this was the final closing. And so uh, I get to New York. I had to move all of my friars to this point into a hotel across the street. They lived there for three years. So, so they were thrilled. Uh, yeah. You're everybody's friend. <laughs> well, we had the 23rd floor. We had some nice views. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so I get into the hotel room, and my top advisor calls me and said, Father John, uh, we got to meet. We, we, this may not happen tomorrow. I said, so-and-so, it may not happen. And he said, is a million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars Either they're going to get it or we're going to get it. We should get that money and not them. It's, it's, it's something slipped through. I mean, this is a 300 and something million dollar project. It's a fraction of a percent of the yeah. whole thing, yeah. So we meet the next day at the Regency Hotel in Park Avenue, which a number of weeks later, the New York Times did an article with a picture and saying, this is where the major deals are made over breakfast in New York City. <laughs> 8.30, I'll never forget it. We met and we back and forth, back and forth. At 11.20, they got up and said, the deal's off. And they walked out. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh my God, I said, I'll have to move to another planet. I mean, I, <laughs> we, we, I had already committed the province to millions of dollars in this project. <laughs> we had a hole in the ground in the middle of midtown Manhattan. So you demolished the buildings? The buildings were down, oh, and we, they were digging into the, 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 it's the rock there, granite-type rock. And, uh, and I thought, oh, so I got back to tell my, the boss at the time, my predecessor. But I'll never forget, at 1210, they called and said, we blinked, you win. It was a bluff. <laughs> Bluff. So your friend was right about how... how well, my advisor was. said, they have as much money in this as you do. They're bluffing. They're bluffing. And they were bluffing. Wow. Yeah. That's and then, where it's good to have an experienced hand to kind of guide you through, because emotionally, I don't know if you could survive something like that. They used to they used to say to me, my team of four, five, six of lawyers, I mean, I had to be tutored in everything from tax law to construction law to over four years. But they, their famous thing would be, don't give, don't give in, don't give in. <laughs> yeah, Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, you're pastorally trained, and it's like a compromise in a good sense. Right, you know, right, work right. With Let's the be person. reasonable. Trust what they're saying. You, know, you have to exactly really readjust all of your lenses uh, in that area and that. So that, that afternoon then, after they said, okay, you get the 1.2, the 1 million 250, we, um, we did the closing. And we had to sign some 400 documents. They put me in a chair, not unlike this chair, and, and the room was as big as this room. Uh, at any given time, there were 50 people in the room because the um, uh, federal government, we have low-income uh, housing, and that's, that's very, very strictly regulated by the state of New York and the federal government. And so they would roll me down, and I'd sign and roll me down and the other people that are partners in that. Uh, and, and the federal government and the state rep came to me that day and said, this may well be the most complicated complex real estate deal we have seen in the history of the United States <laughs> oh and New York City. I said, tell me about it. And you're the lucky guy to notice it the gray hair I had. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we closed and uh, and then we did two years of construction. Um, I can't believe it only took two years. Yeah, to, yeah, no, they, they were good coming Gotham construction. And it's, because it's how many stories? It's it, well it's sixty three, it actually was going to be higher. It was going to be in the area of seventy two to seventy four. And what you have to do when you build a skyscraper is you have to do wind tunnel tests. And we, ours were done in a lab in Toronto, Canada. And we are two blocks, uh, the Empire State Building is two blocks north and east of us. When they did the wind tunnel test, they built a miniature a mm -hmm. model of the city with our building. They said that when a nor'easter hits New York City and hits the Empire State Building, it'll wrap around and come full blast into our building, which it does to some extent now. So we can go off 70-something stories, but it would cost us several million dollars more for the reinforced concrete to do it. Oh, wow. So we cut it back to, it's, it's back, actually, it's 60 stories of livable space, and there's three stories what they call a cupola, and that's, that makes it 63 stories. Okay. There's some storage and things up in that area. Um, but 63 stories, we have, we have five on our side. We have on the 32nd Street side, which I'm really proud of, is I negotiated uh, a Hope Lodge, which is a place where cancer patients stay free of charge uh, for seven days to seven months undergoing chemotherapy at the four cancer centers in New York. Wow. New York never had one before. And the American Cancer Society told me that because of what I had done, 
that I had saved cancer patients in the first few years of four to five million dollars. That's and, amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful setup that they have. And then we have 400, approximately 448 apartments, of which 20% are low income, and they really are low income. Uh, and they're in a lottery. They go through a state lottery uh, to be able to get yeah. those and that. And then we have, we, so we own, we own our part. We own the way they're called, there's three legal condominiums. We own our part, which is one. We own uh, part of the tower, which is two. American Cancer owns theirs. And then we also own part of the parking lot below. Wow. So that was a... Uh, That's interesting. You, you did it in a very Franciscan way that there's low income, focus on low income housing, and then also the uh, cancer patients. This is That's a very Franciscan spirit. You've seen the spirituality of it work its way into a New York City <laughs> construction well, we, project. Well, we really, because at one point they said, do you want to do condom, um, uh, condos? And I said, no, not doing condos, because they're rich. And, yeah. we, we, you know, we're not going to be the friars who built a condominium. A right, condo right. Building, yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and they also g gave good advice. They said, you don't want to do hotels because if the economy goes sour, the hotel, and because you see that yeah. now, oh, COVID, boy. Yeah, big time. And you don't want to do a commercial build. We, we didn't want to do a commercial building. We really want to do something resonance for people. Because yeah. housing, especially affordable, is so badly needed in New York City. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, too, is that we have, there's a whole series of ethical, moral guidelines as to what can take place. We have some retail on 32nd Street. Uh, and what kind of behaviors allowed in the building and that that our partners agreed to even though they're they're um, they're not Catholic yeah um, but that was important for us that that's, that's critical yeah, who we are yeah. yeah who we are in that so it represented who we are and uh, and the other interesting thing about this is that is that there was always the concern that well the friars are building a multi-million dollar building uh, will that come across as well isn't that against Franciscanism in that right but of course the friars were involved in the economy in middle middle uh, age cities long before anybody else uh, in the inner cities uh, of uh, uh, places like Florence and places like that. And the money that we get from this, we use for good purposes, for the poor, right. for our missions, right. for training our guys in the seminary, for a lot of older guys now taking care of them, et cetera. Uh, we, you know, we're not splurging somewhere with all of this. But there was a concern my predecessor had. He said, I'm just so concerned. Forbes magazine wanted to do an article on me. And he said, no. He said, I said, they just want to talk about the priest doing this like this. And, and he said, no, 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 I'm afraid of the publicity. Well, you can't avoid publicity. And what he was most afraid of the tabloids picking it up, you know, the New York Post and just blasting it. Well, the New York Times calls me and said, <laughs> they said, uh, uh, Father O'Connor, we understand you're doing this building, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we'd like to interview you. So the reporter interviews me. Then a second reporter interviews me. Then one of the managing editors interviews me. Well, the article comes out, and it's a half page in the New York Times, Friars Build and all about the American Cancer Society, and it's fantastically positive. So much so people called up and said, can I give a donation to the building? Yeah. And I said, no, 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 we don't need donations in that. But it was just... That's what we call controlling the message, Father. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you don't get out front, someone else will. That's right, that's right, that's right. Well, I, you know, one of the things at St. Bonaventure that helped me, they have a great school of mass communications mm. and journalism. They have several Pulitzer Prize winners. Oh, and cool. uh, and uh, so I learned because because when I taught there and director campus ministry, I used to work with the editors of the Bonaventure, the school newspaper, and the professors in journalism, and they taught me those kinds of things. Mm. So that um, even when I was provincial, I brought in Jocelyn Thomas, uh, who is our director of communications, and uh, we we had a whole system controlling in a sense, you know. So you. Yeah. You, you you do it the right way, and I, I they taught me how to do it the right way. Very good. Well, just for reference for people, the article that Father mentioned before is in St. Anthony Messenger. It's uh, volume 128, the April 2021. They did a, a, the, a Renaissance Friar a article about a lot of these exper his, this experience and other things. Um, so that that's just the, just for reference. But I want to ask you. You had mentioned that there was these like closings along the way, and I'm assuming like the first ones, like everyone's incredibly consequential, but it's like once you decide to even start, right. you have to lean in entirely. And there's you a do. huge amount of faith that we're going to be able to get to these next closings and that these negotiations will happen in good faith and that you won't get ripped off and all these things. What was your prayer life like? So the, there's obviously the Franciscan spirituality, you know, materialized in what the building does yeah. and what it's suited for. Um, how did you bring your own spirituality, your prayer life to the project, probably just to survive emotionally, but how did you pray through this project? Well, I really placed it in, in God's hands, and you know, especially I would say in my prayer that, Lord, you know, you're not the only one expert in building here, <laughs> right. and, and uh, I'm taking huge, huge risks for the friars, uh, and I know you love the friars, um, 
and I need you to be with me in this and your spirit guide me as best possible as we go through these different stages. And, and I, I mean, in the end, I had to make the decisions. I, yeah. mean, I was not in charge of the province, but they depended on me. There was no other friar negotiating with me at the negotiation table. Yeah. And and because uh, you would have all the knowledge of what's of the well, key I had the knowledge and no one else really seemed to want to get involved with it because it really was, it was time consuming. And uh, and it was an area where most friars would say, I'm not interested in that, that kind yeah. of thing in that. So it was really it, it was it was bringing my life to my prayer, mm. bringing my life to my prayer so that I wasn't I wasn't uh, there was not a dichotomy where, OK, I'm going to be the businessman doing this. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm going to be the Franciscan over here. It really right. was integrating the two. And, and, and so my prayer became not just prayer in terms of ministry that I was doing, but also prayer in terms of sharing with the Lord what was happening and the, and the days that I was, quite frankly, almost scared. Yeah. Uh, and the days when, when I was saying, you know, what happens if this doesn't go? Uh, you know, you know it, just, yeah. it was just, the administration had put an awful, tons and tons of faith in me and they trusted me in this whole thing. And, uh, and I didn't want to in any way belie that trust. Did you ever get a sense that that attitude and that, that prayer life was influencing the room? Because, again, you're dealing with people who are kind of cutthroat and people that right. are hard charging, and they'll say something they don't mean to see how you respond to it. It's, it's a very different world that I'm sure <laughs> than the friary. Yeah. Did you get a sense that you bringing that, just the presence of the habit in that boardroom, impacted the, the way people communicated or, or, or how the negotiations went down? You know, I'd love to be able to say to you it did, but that's a tough world. Yeah. And and uh, one one Franciscan priest showing up in a boardroom. <clears throat> uh, I, you know, and let me let me backtrack a little bit though. Uh, our partners uh, were Jewish. Are Jewish still our partners at this point? And what did happen is we did have a discussion over over what Christianity versus uh, um, you know the Jewish faith and that and some good discussions. And my top advisor, uh, who's not Catholic himself. He, he and I spent so much time together that he used to ask me some really good, deep questions about my faith, the Franciscans, the Catholic Church, and that. So, yeah, there was impact on that level. But when you got the big group together, uh, yeah, it was tough, tough business yeah, uh, at I that can point. Only imagine. Now, the one thing that was interesting is that once in a while I'd go out to lunch with some of our partners, and we would go to these restaurants where the, the major, I mean, I met a lot of the major real estate people that do the big projects in New York City people from a related uh, and uh, Tishman Spire and that. And our partners would love to say, because uh, I wouldn't have a habit on at that time, and sometimes I'd have maybe just a sport coat on or something mm -hmm. if, we'd go, if it was informal, and they would introduce me and say, guess what he is? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they would say, can you imagine our partner is a Catholic priest? <laughs> Needless to say, there aren't many Catholic priests doing real estate. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I can imagine. Certainly not a, amongst the Franciscans as well. But it's a fascinating project. I do encourage people to read this uh, story. It, the story was written by our very own Ann Argerton. Yeah, did a great um, job. Yeah, with, the, with Arlington Catholic Herald. But it's in the St. Anthony Messenger. It's called A Renaissance Friar. Father, maybe somebody listening who wants to learn more about Franciscan spirituality, maybe they've been really inspired by Pope Francis and the witness, even right. though he's Jesuit, you know, he, he's provided a lot of kind of window and light on um, on Francis. Um, where would you recommend they start in learning more if they want to dig a little deeper? Well, well actually, and it put a little plug in for the magazine, Franciscan, that magazine is part, part of what's called Franciscan Media. Right. And, and uh, they have all kinds of resources in terms of Franciscan spirituality, Franciscan tradition and that. So I'd really recommend people, uh, if they Google Franciscan Media. It's in Cincinnati, Ohio. They'll see all of the uh, the links to it, uh, and it's very, very. It's it's great. And for someone who's discerning the priesthood and maybe feels that they might be called to be a, a Franciscan, what would you? Where where should they go? What would be a good starting point? That for they them? actually, I'm actually the regional vocation director for the Friars. So, oh, they, they so, so you're the guy. Media. All right. <laughs> you can find him at St. Francis of Assisi <laughs> at Triangle. That's right. Well, Father, thank you so much for your time and for sharing this story. This article's got a lot more good stories about your work, you know, with uh, the fire and um, firemen and you're uh, landing on an aircraft carrier. Yeah. But that, that'll have to be a story for another day. But again, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, Billy. Okay. You're listening to Searching for More. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Also, make sure you follow the Diocese and the Arlington Catholic Herald on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channels for regular videos that inspire, educate, and inform about the Catholic faith in our diocesan community.